Well, good morning, everyone. I would say a very warm welcome, but uh, <laughs> I, think, I think the weather said that for us. Obviously, we welcome all of you who are here. We also very warmly welcome those who are joining us on live stream and those who will watch us later either on Facebook Record or on YouTube. I would say for those people who are watching remotely that this is going to be a service of communion. Um, you may like to get yourself a small piece of bread and something to drink so that you too can share in this communion service with us. It's lovely to have you with us. Our call to worship this morning comes from the book of Micah. Come, let us go to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, that he may teach us his ways, that we may walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. He shall judge between the many peoples, shall decide for the powerful nations far away, and they shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning forks. Nation shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war any more. But they shall sit every man under his vine and under his fig tree, and no one shall make them afraid. For the mouth of the Lord of hosts has spoken, for all the people walk each in the name of its own God, but we will walk in the name of the Lord our God forever and ever. With those words ringing in our ears, we are going to stand and sing our first hymn, In Christ Alone. Now, I have been asked by Karen to remember that in between the verses, she likes to do a twiddly bit. So just, just remember that there is a, a slight gap between the verses. Thank you.
Let us pray. Living God, in whose name we walk for ever and ever, be with us now as we come to worship you in purity. Help us weak beings to leave our worries, our cares, our burdens and our anxieties at that door. Help us, Lord, to come to you and to you alone. Fill this place with your love and with your peace that passes all understanding. May we meet you here in this brief hour and see your glory. And we thank you for the salvation that you promise to all who turn to you. Living God, we do not deserve any part of that salvation as we are weak and failing humans. Yet, you have assured us that if we come to you in humility, you will in no way ever cast us out. Forgive us our failings, Lord, our weaknesses that you know so well. Take our weak knees and our limp hands, our sinful thoughts and the swords of our sharp tongues, and beat us, Lord, into useful plowshares for your kingdom. May we indeed become instruments of your peace by serving you, by serving one another, in and through your mighty name. We sum up all our prayers in the words that you yourself taught us, Lord, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive them that trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. We are now singing again, yes. We're going to sing a very well-known song, Faithful One. We're going to sing this through twice. I don't think there's any twiddly bits in this, is there, Karen? <laughs> no, that's all right.
Now Lizzie is going to come and give us our children's reading. This is going to be the last in the series of healings that Jesus did. That uh, He did lots, lots more, but this is the one we're going to do. This one is called The Centurion's Servant. The Roman centurion stood before his soldiers. There were a hundred in all, each and every man sworn to do whatever the centurion commanded. Fetch my sword, he ordered. Yes, sir, right away, sir, shouted one of the soldiers, and he was off in a flash. Fetch my shield, he added. Yes, sir, right away, sir, and another soldier ran off as well. Forward, march, and he shouted. Everyone was ready. Yes, sir, right away, sir, answered each and every man, and they marched off together through the streets of Capernaum. The centurion was used to giving orders, and he was used to being obeyed, not only by his men, but by the people of Capernaum as well. For the Romans were in charge of that city and all the land where Jesus lived, a land they had taken by force and now ruled with a cruel hand. One day... The centurion went home to hear some bad news. His servant was ill, unable to move and in great pain. The centurion felt sorry for his servant, but for all his power, there was nothing he could do, no order he could give to make that pain go away. So the centurion went to see Jesus. He'd heard that Jesus made sick people well, and so his request was simple. Help me, sir, he said. My servant is terribly ill. The people standing round Jesus wondered what he would do. This centurion and his soldiers had bullied them, had stolen from them, and pushed them around. Would Jesus do for this man what he had done for so many others? But there was no question in Jesus' mind. He had taught his followers to love everyone, even their enemies. How could he do any less? I will go and heal him, he said. And then the centurion said something that surprised them all. No, he said. And could he be that he was remembering all the cruel things he had done? I do not deserve to have you visit, visit my house. But I do know this. I am a man with power and authority. I tell my soldiers to fetch this, and they do it, saying, Yes, sir, right away, sir. I tell them to fetch something else, and the answer is always the same. Yes, sir. Right away, sir. And when I order them to march, they obey. Yes, sir. Right away, sir. You have power, too. Power over sickness. So all you need to do is give the order, and I know that my servant will be healed. Jesus turned to those around him amazed. This man trusts me. He really does. I've not found this kind of trust even among our own people. And I'm telling you the truth when I say that people just like this man, people from all over the world, will one day be a part of all God is doing. But because they do not trust me, some of our own people will miss out. Then he turned to the centurion and said, Go, all that you hope for will happen. And at that very hour, the centurion's servant was healed. Yes, sir. Right away, sir. The second reading this morning is from 2 Timothy, verses 3. Sorry, chapter 3, verses 10 through to 4, chapter, uh, verse 5. <laughs> Sorry, come verses and chapters all mixed up. All scripture is breathed out by God. You, however, have followed my teaching, my conduct, my aim in life, my faith, my patience, my love, my steadfastness, my persecutions and sufferings that happened to me at Antioch, at Iconium and at Lystra, which persecutions I endured, yet from them all the Lord rescued me. 
Indeed, all who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted, while evil people and impostors will go on from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. But as for you, continue in what you have learned and have firmly believed, and knowing from whom you learned it, and how from childhood you have been acquainted with the sacred writings which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. All scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. I charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead, and by his appearing and his kingdom, preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, and exhort with complete patience and teaching. For the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching but will have itching ears that will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions and will turn away from listening to the truth and wander off into myths. As for you, always be sober-minded, endure suffering, do the work of an evangelist and fulfill your ministry. The third reading is from Matthew 10, 32 through to 40. Everyone who acknowledges me before men, I also will acknowledge before my Father who is in heaven. But whoever denies me before men, I also will deny before my Father who is in heaven. Do not think that I have come to bring peace to the earth. I have not come to bring peace. For the sword, for I have come to set a man against his father, and a daughter against her mother, and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law, and a person's enemies will be those of his own household. Whoever loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me, and whoever loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And whoever does not take his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Whoever finds his life will lose it. And, when, and whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. Whoever receives you receives me. And whoever receives me receives him who sent me. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We're going to sing that lovely version of The Lord's My Shepherd, the Townsend version.
Let us pray. Lord, open your scriptures to us. Give us new understandings, Lord. And may we take this message to our hearts, Lord, and ponder on it during the week to come. In the name of Jesus, amen. The word peace means different things to different people. In my younger days, it was marching under a CND banner in numerous campaigns, tying my son's first booties to the fence at Fast Lane Nuclear Submarine Base, visiting those lovely ladies at Greenham Common. Oh yes, I was that man who did all that, who tried to share the dream of Martin Luther King, to become the peace that Gandhi wanted us to be. I imagined with John Lennon, I prayed with Ma Mother Teresa, and held the prayer of St. Francis of Assisi in my heart. But it's taken me a long time to realize that there are very different kinds of peace. The dove returning with the olive branch to the ark was a promise from God that the flood was over, while the rainbow was his sign that he would never exterminate the whole of mankind ever again. That, for me, is the true meaning of the rainbow. It is the promise of God. Now, 700 years before the birth of Jesus, Isaiah wrote about Jesus. He would be the wonderful counselor, the mighty God, the everlasting father, the prince of peace. At his birth, the angels sang, glory to God in the highest and on earth peace among those with whom he is pleased. Again, when he was presented in the temple, Simeon took him in his arms and exclaimed, Lord, now let your servant depart in peace according to your word. The seventh beatitude in the Sermon on the Mount is blessed are the peacemakers for they shall be called the sons of God. And Jesus talking to his inner circle of disciples before he leaves them says peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you, not as the world gives you, do I give to you. Let not your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. As the early church was to discover, God's peace and man's peace are two entirely different things. During the first century, the Roman world was in relative peace, sometimes called the Pax Romana, after the upheavals following the murder of Julius Caesar in 44 BC. But it was enforced peace, held in place under the studded sandals of the heavily armed soldiers and with fear. God's peace is the kind of peace that is the third fruit of the Spirit in Galatians. That forms the shoes of the Christian warrior in Ephesians. And it's not just about practicing non-violence. The peace that pass <coughs> excuse me, the peace that passes all understanding came through the suffering of the cross. It was when the sin 
that each of us have accumulated was nailed once and for all upon the tree at Calvary. It was the opening up of the direct route into the very presence of God, the rending of the curtain temple, and that triumphant last shout, it is finished. Peace is restored. A restored relationship that we have with God directly as a result of the cross and the sacrifice of Jesus and his victory over death and sin. Indeed, not as the world gives. The peace of God is something way greater than anything this world has to offer. It's something more magnificent, something so great that we should be shouting it from the rooftops. The peace that we have been given is the peace that we've received directly through God's grace. It is unearned. It is a gift. All we have to do is to acknowledge Jesus as our Savior, and he will acknowledge us to the Father who sent him. So we get to this apparently awkward verse. Do not think that I have come to bring peace to the earth. I have not come to bring peace but a sword. Or as Luke puts it, I have come to bring division. That's because, of course, the Greek readers did not understand the significance of the sword of God in Jewish literature, our Old Testament. Now, problem verses in our Bible have been used to justify all kinds of appalling deeds from the Crusades onwards. This quote about bringing a sword has been adopted by many militias throughout the world and how wrong they are. Jesus was not advocating violence but stating a fact. The sword of God in Jewish literature stood for division and judgment. So Luke got that right. The flaming sword in Genesis 3 was placed to divide mankind from the tree of life after the judgment of God in banning mankind from Eden for his disobedience. Immediately after his baptism, Jesus went three rounds with the devil, that wily old serpent, who was out to try and destroy the mission before it got going. His ham-fisted attempts to drive a wedge between Jesus and his mission was bound to fail, and it did. Because Jesus understood scripture better than the devil, and he used it correctly. There's a lesson there for us too, not to misuse scripture. So what was Jesus saying? Well, he explains that there will always be a gap between those who belong to him and those who don't. Even within families, sadly, there are sharp divisions. Jesus' own family thought he was mad, and they wanted to take him home. I think some members of my family think I'm a bit potty with all this church stuff. Jesus was saying very clearly that many would misunderstand his mission and would not respond to his invitation to follow him, 
to turn down the opportunity of an eternity spent with him. But he's also saying something else. We could easily miss this one. He's not promising a cushy, easy life. Far from it. He tells his followers that they will be persecuted, reviled, beaten and imprisoned. And many of them would lose their lives here on earth. And many of them did. As we know from the book of Acts, Stephen, J Stephen James the son of Zebedee, certainly died, will record it. And we also know that Peter, Paul, and James, the brother of Jesus, died in Rome. There are also other accounts whereby all the disciples and the evangelists were executed for their faith. Being a Christian in 2022 is not easy. Some parts of the world, it's less easy than other parts. If you admit and acknowledge Jesus on social media, for instance, you will be viciously attacked by trolls, those armchair keyboard warriors who become instant experts in their own eyes. They do not endure sound teaching of the gospel, but have itching ears for the false teachers who tell them what they want to hear, just as we heard from that reading in Timothy. We live in the greatest age of misinformation ever. You think the world is flat? Well, the internet can put you in touch with millions of crackpots who think just the same. Whole hordes of people have turned away from listening to the truth as it is too hard and it would mean them giving up their precious lifestyles. Oh dear. They would have to start living by the rules of the kingdom of heaven. It's rules of love and care for other people. Meanwhile, we have one offensive weapon in our armory. The mighty sword of the Spirit, the very word of God, literally, as we heard, breathed out by God himself. And with it, we are commanded to stand our ground. Resolute, firm, looking only to Jesus as our captain and following what he wants us to do. As it says in Hebrews, for the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and of spirit, of joints and marrow, discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. This book is a mighty weapon which we spend a lifetime learning how to wield. The sword in the Old Testament stood for judgment, the judgment of God himself. And Jesus coming to earth heralded that time of judgment. Now he did not come to condemn the world, as we read in John 3, but rather that by him the world might be saved through him. But as he makes clear, those that deny him will be cut off from the inheritance he has prepared for us. The inevitable result of Christ coming into the world would be conflict between Christ and the Antichrist, between light and dark, between love and hate, between Christ's followers and those who follow the opposition. Confessing Christ is not an option on the menu. It is an absolute necessity. 
Many believers will not confess him as their Lord and will face the consequences. There is a world of opportunity out there. There are billions of lives at stake. We need to live out our Christian lives and proclaim Christ to all because they need the opportunity to share in the eternity won for us on the cross by our ever-living and triumphant Saviour Jesus. We have to become the living Bibles for others to read or else how will they hear? How will they know to follow him? Amen. After those words, we're going to have a quite a meditative, I think it's quite a meditative hymn. How deep the Father's love for us.
that all right? My sound check at the back. Was that hymn new to some people? It's lovely, though. The words are absolutely very fitting for as we come now to celebrate the Lord's Supper. Let's pray. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hidden, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. We do not presume to come to this your table, merciful Lord, trusting in our own righteousness, but in your manifold and great mercies. We are not worthy so much as to gather up the crumbs under your table, but you are the same Lord whose nature is always to have mercy. Grant us therefore, gracious Lord, so to eat the flesh of your dear Son, Jesus Christ, and to drink his blood that our sinful bodies may be made clean by his body and our souls washed through his most precious blood, that we might evermore dwell in him and he in us. Amen. Lord Jesus Christ, present with us now, as we do here in Butt Lane what you did in an upstairs room. Breathe your spirit upon us as we eat and drink, renewing, sustaining, and making us whole, so that we may now be your body here on earth, loving and caring for all our brothers and sisters in this world. The table of bread and wine has been made ready. It is the table of the company with Jesus and all who love him. It is the table of sharing with the poor of the world with whom Jesus identified himself. So come to this table, you who have much faith and you who would have more. You who have been here often and you who have been here less often. You who have tried to follow Jesus, and you who have failed. Come. It is Christ who invites us to meet him here. Among friends, gathered round a table, Jesus took bread. And having given thanks for it, he broke it and gave it to his disciples saying, this is my body given for you. In the same way, he took wine. And having given thanks for it, he gave it to his disciples saying, this cup is the new relationship with God sealed with my blood. Take it and share it. Drink this in remembrance of me. I shall drink wine with you again in the coming kingdom of God. Look, the bread of life is broken for the life of the world. Here is Christ remembered in bread and wine. 
the gifts of God for the people of God. Take, eat, and be thankful. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Drink you all of this in remembrance of him. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Father of all, we give you thanks and praise that when we were still far off, you met us in your Son and brought us home. Dying and living, you declared your love, gave us grace and opened the gate of glory. May we who share Christ's body live his risen life. We who drink his cup bring life to others. We whom the Spirit lights give light to the world. Keep us firm in the hope that you have set before us so that we and all your children shall be free and the whole earth live to praise your name 
through Christ our Lord. Amen. Particularly this morning we are praying for June, who is extremely ill at the moment. Lord, we pray that your hand will be upon June. And we pray that you will be with her during the next few days. And we commit her care to you, Lord, because we know that you are the only one who can save and restore. In the name of Jesus. Amen. For our last hymn, just a brief reminder that our Stuart, up here, you got a nice wave there Stuart, <laughs> I know you couldn't see it all through the screen, but our Stuart here is going to be doing a sponsored bicycle ride in um, aid of St. Luke's Hospice, Winford. And he has brought sponsor forms for those who uh, have not yet sponsored him if they would wish to. Now, our final hymn may be new to some of you. And it was put on the WhatsApp group earlier this week. It's called Peace, Perfect Peace. Now, Karen is going to play it through once so that we can get an idea of that. And after that, we'll have the blessing and then the doxology, and we will put the words of the doxology up since people seem to have forgotten. So let's hear the tune first of all.
That's a lovely song, isn't it? Sorry about the misprint in verse 3. <laughs> now may the peace of God that passes all understanding keep our hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. And we ask that the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, be upon us and remain with us now and always. Amen.